Good evening. My name is David O'Mahony. I'm head of cinema programming at the Irish Film Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to iFi at Home and to introduce this very special panel discussion on the Night of Ideas, which will explore issues raised in the film we have just watched, The Great Green Wall. Before we begin, I want to thank our partners in the event, the French Embassy in Ireland, for making, making this event happen this evening. And I also wish to thank the Arts Council for their ongoing support of everything that we do at IFI, especially during these difficult times. And now I'm gonna hand over to our host for the panel, Saib O'Neill, Policy Coordinator of Stop Climate Chaos Coalition, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. You're all very welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to, you to this panel discussion this evening following the wonderful film we've just watched. We're joined this evening by three esteemed guests, uh, Professor Ali Guse, Don Mullen and Sarah Elsed. Now, if you have a question for any of the panelists, uh, please use the comment box under the screen and we'll come to those questions after our discussion. Um, but to begin with, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Professor Aliou Gusset. Uh, we're so fortunate this evening to have with us one of the instigators of the Great Green Wall project in Senegal. Professor Gusset is Professor of Ecology at the Sheikh Ante Diop University in Dakar, co-director of Senegal's International Humanity and Nature Observatory, and he's an expert on the Great Green Wall project. We're also joined this evening by interpreter Fanny Grendo Kelly. So to begin with, Professor, I want to welcome you to our discussion. And I might begin by asking you about the history of the Great Green Wall Project. In many ways, the project has come to symbolize African leadership on climate action. And why do you think this project is so special and so important? Tout d'abord, Professor Guisset, j'aimerais vous accueillir et je voudrais vous poser une question qui concerne l'historique de la grande muraille verte. En quoi pensez-vous, est-ce que vous pourriez nous parler un petit peu de l'historique de cette grande muraille et aussi en quoi pensez-vous que cette œuvre symbolise un esprit d'avant-garde de la part de l'Afrique et en quoi est-ce que ce projet est vraiment très spécial Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais aussi en retour vous remercier de l'invitation et c'est un honneur évidemment que vous me faites mais euh, je suis aussi très 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 fier et très content de parler de la grande muraille verte. Um, in return I would very much like to thank you very much for inviting me. It's a true honor to take part in this event and um, I look forward to explaining how, how proud I am to be representing the Great Green Wall tonight. Très bien. Alors, je voudrais dire que l'originalité d'abord de la Grande Muraille Verte, c'est parce que, tout simplement, c'est un des projets qui a été imaginé pour les Africains et par les Africains. La première fois dans l'histoire qu'on a parlé de la Grande Muraille Verte, c'était en 2002. C'était un sommet qui s'est tenu à Ndiamena à l'occasion, justement, de la journée mondiale euh, pour combattre la désertification et la sécheresse. So first, I would like to, and um, I would like to talk about the origins of the Great Green Wall. So this is the, it is one of the many projects by African people for African people. The first time this project was mentioned was in 2002 in a summit that took place took place in Yamena, and during this day in which the project was the project was being honored uh, we were in particularly talking about desertification alors l'initiative ou le projet a suivi son cours et là où ça a pris de l'importance c'était lors de euh, le, lors de la cinquième session de la conférence des chefs de gouvernement africains de la communauté des états sahélo sahéliens qui s'est tenu donc à Ouaga, au Burkina Faso, le 1er et 2 juin 2005. Very good. So, uh, the, <coughs> the importance of this project was in, particularly, in particular emphasized during the seventh session of the African Nations Summit, an African Nations Summit, uh, which took place in a, in a Sahel territory. And this took place in Burkina Faso in 2005. Très bien. Et la troisième date importante qui a eu ou qui a eu l'approbation, ça a eu lieu lors 
de la huitième session tenue à Addis Abeba le 29 et 30 janvier 2007. And then the third important date that I would like to highlight was and um, was an event the, it was the third uh, it was the eighth session that took place in January 2007 in Addis Abeba. These are three very important dates that I would like to mention tonight. Voilà donc comment est-ce que les choses ont, ont démarré. À partir de ce moment, donc les personnes qui ont donné le nom, c'est entre Obasanjo et Ablaywad, ils ont trouvé ce fameux nom Green Green Wood et depuis lors, c'est ce mot, c'est ce nom qui a été adopté et cela marche. Donc il y a eu beaucoup de partenaires et ces partenaires, on peut citer donc l'agence panafricaine, il y a l'ICRAF, il y a la Banque mondiale, il y a le SILS, le CENSAT, la FAO, hein, et ça a commencé justement comme ça. So, uh, the first time this idea was brought about was by Obla Sanjo and Oblanad, and they gave the name, these two, these two men gave the name Great Green Wall. This is a name that stuck, a name that people would remember. Of course, there were many, many participants, many partners who contributed, who have contributed uh, to this project ever since uh, the mid 2000s. For example, the Pan-African group, the FAO, so many, so many participants and actors who made it work, who contributed to this project. Ce qu'on peut retenir, c'est que aussi c'est à partir de cette année-là, 2007, que l'État du Sénégal nous a confié, nous universitaires, d'organiser un séminaire international pour discuter pour la première fois de ce qu'on pouvait faire au niveau de la Grande Muraille Verte. Donc, nous avons invité d'éminents chercheurs qui sont venus de tous les continents, des États-Unis, du Japon, de la France, d'Angleterre, etc. Et la question principale, c'est qu'on leur demandait, que pensez-vous des espèces qui pourraient résister, qu'on pourrait utiliser dans le reboisement de la Grande Muraille Verte. C'était ça la question principale. So, ever since 2007, the state of Senegal invested in us uh, academics the duty to organize an international congress. And the, obviously the topic of this congress was the Great Green Wall. And for this congress, we invited many, many important researchers in the field from the United States, from Japan, from France, from the UK. And our core question was, what species, what types of plants do you think we should use to create this great green wall? Can I come in there actually, just because I was going to ask you about that, Professor. It seems to some of us almost counterintuitive that you can fight desertification by planting trees on such a large scale. Um, you know, surely the, the trees struggle to survive and thrive. So how do you go about planting the right trees in the right place? Uh, how do you choose what to plant? Okay. Are you planting a crop or are you planting uh, just the trees that are going to survive? C'est très intéressant que vous que vous soyez venu vous-même à ce thème, parce que j'allais vous poser justement une, cette question plutôt technique, euh, plutôt botanique. Euh, C'est-à-dire que ça semble un petit peu contre-intuitif, ça semble un peu étrange de vouloir planter des arbres quand on sait que les arbres ont du mal à pousser dans des, sur des terrains euh, qui sont sujets à la sécheresse. Donc, justement, est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire comment est-ce que, est que vous choisissez les bonnes espèces Est-ce que vous choisissez de planter euh, euh, peut-être euh, une espèce qui a du rendement du genre, du, le genre de blé, etc. Où est-ce que vous plantez des arbres Alors, on part d'abord sur plusieurs aspects. D'abord, les espèces qui ont été retenues, ce sont des espèces qui sont adaptées au stress hydrique, c'est-à-dire qui peuvent résister à des, à des taux de sécheresse très élevés. Je rappelle seulement que cette région, le Sahel, qui est cette bande-là, à la ouest en est, c'est une zone où la quantité de pluie par an varie entre 100 mm et 400 mm seulement. Par an. Très bien. Donc, uh, so, I would like to, to talk about many aspects. First, the most important thing is to pick species, plants, trees, that are adapted to water stress, to conditions where water is extremely, is extremely scarce. And we're talking about the Sahel, so from the west of Africa to the east of Africa. This is a, an area of the world where 
per year, you would have between 100 millimeters to 400 millimeters of water a year and of, of rainfall. Alors, donc, vous voyez déjà que pour, euh, euh, être, pour être planté là, il faut que ce soit des espèces assez spéciales. Alors, la spécialité de ces espèces, c'est ce qu'on appelle en écologie la zéromorphose. C'est un processus d'adaptation de quelques espèces seulement à la sécheresse qui se font par deux aspects. D'abord, au niveau de la racine. Il faut que l'espèce aille chercher de l'eau le plus loin possible. Ça, c'est la première stratégie. Donc, il a, euh, ce sont des espèces qui ont des racines pivotantes, très profondes, des fois six à sept fois plus longues que la partie aérienne. Ça, c'est la première stratégie. Excellent. Deuxième... Oh, pardon. <rire> Alors, il y a... There are two strategies, two approaches to finding the perfect species for this area. So, first, uh, you will find extremely specific species. Uh, it, they're species that are called zero morphosis. That's one of their aspects. That's what we say in ecology. And they're adapted to drought. So, one main aspect is that they have extremely deep roots and these roots can spin on themselves to adapt to drought. And the roots, pragmatically speaking, are seven, six to seven times longer than the tree is high. La deuxième stratégie, c'est de faire de telle sorte que, puisque nous sommes dans des pays très chauds, dans une zone très chaude, c'est de faire de telle sorte que la plante perde le moins d'eau, parce que tout simplement, avec la chaleur, il y a un phénomène d'évapotranspiration qui se fait. Donc, la plante, quand il règle le problème d'aller chercher de l'eau le plus profond, il va régler aussi le problème de perdre le moins d'eau par les feuilles. Excellent. So, um, another, this, the second aspect is for the plant to be adapted to heat, to simple heat. So, we are looking for plants, for species that lose as little water as little moisture as possible through evaporation, among others. So we are looking for species that lose as little water, that use as little water as, as possible. Alors donc, c'est pourquoi ces espèces-là ont de petites feuilles en général pour éviter justement ce phénomène dont j'ai parlé de perte d'eau. Ensuite, au niveau des feuilles, pour éviter encore et réduire les pertes d'eau, Des fois, il y a une stratégie de mettre une cuticule dessus qui est plus ou moins imperméable et qui empêche encore toujours, qui rend euh, la manière de perdre l'eau encore de manière plus réduite. Excellent. Hein? Et cette cuticule, elle est sur l'arbre ou sur le fruit Comment Et cette cuticule, est-ce qu'elle est placée sur l'arbre ou sur le fruit Sur les feuilles. Sur les feuilles, sur les feuilles. Excellent. Et pour la partie supérieure de la feuille. Et yeah. même fois, la stratégie va jusqu'à transformer les feuilles en épines. Et ces oh. épines, avec elles sont solides, elles sont dures, donc pratiquement, elles limitent complètement les pertes d'eau au niveau de la plante. Et c'est ça qui fait qu'elles s'adaptent. Another, another aspect of these really well adapted plants and species of trees would be that they have extremely small leaves. This way, it minimizes the loss of water and the use of moisture by the plant itself. And there's another technique. So then uh, man interferes and would protect these leaves themselves by adding little layers to limit the evaporation even more. And then what we can try and do through hybridation is to turn these leaves into needles. So obviously that limits as well the, the use of water by the plant itself. Can I come in there and just ask <laughs> Professor one further question? Clearly this project couldn't even take off without that kind of scientific and evidence-based expertise. It's, it's so, uh, the plants are so carefully chosen. But what seems so critical to the success of the project all across the Sahel is the involvement of local communities. And how is it that the project has been so successful in getting local communities to commit to the project, to engage in all the planting, very often perhaps when they're busy planting and tending to their own crops. And, and how does the project address the question of nomadic populations who might manage livestock? Because sometimes there might be some interference with the trees by livestock or the, the, some resistance to, to planting trees in the first place. Um, so you might tell us a little about that. Thank you. 
Donc, à l'évidence, cet aspect scientifique, cette recherche est très, très importante. C'est une expertise cruciale. Et est-ce que vous pourriez peut-être nous expliquer comment est-ce que vous avez réussi, comment est-ce que le projet La Grande Muraille Verte, euh, toutes les, tous les acteurs impliqués, ont réussi à, à, à arriver à un succès par rapport aux communautés locales euh, Comment est-ce que ces communautés locales, ou par quels moyens Est-ce qu'elles sont aussi impliquées Et euh, en quoi est-ce que l'élevage, par exemple, parce qu'il y a des communautés qui, qui reposent sur l'élevage pour leur subsistance, euh, comment est-ce que vous avez réussi à, à, à avoir une espèce d'harmonie, un équilibre entre le fait d'avoir un élevage et cette grande muraille verte Alors, le secret, en fait, <rire> c'est tout simplement d'avoir une approche participative. Lorsque nous, scientifiques, nous avons sélectionné et retenu ces espèces-là, qui étaient sur place, hein, que les gens connaissaient. Nous avons mené maintenant des enquêtes chez les populations locales. Dans ce ferlo du Sénégal, il y a trois ethnies. Il y a les Peuls, les Foulani, donc il y a les Wolofs et il y a les Mours, donc qui sont des, des berbères. Mais en général, c'est une région destinée exclusivement à l'élevage. Il y a très peu d'agriculture. Donc, nous sommes allés chez eux. On a envoyé des, des étudiants, des dizaines et des dizaines d'étudiants. Ils sont allés séjourner dans les hameaux et les villages avec des questionnaires pour leur demander mais en fait vous, si vous deviez planter des espèces végétales autour de vos cases dans les parcelles qui vous appartiennent qu'est-ce que vous aurez choisi et donc voilà c'est cette question cruciale oui. et les jours que nous avons passé chez eux, ils ont répondu à ces questions et nous avons fait la confrontation avec les espèces que nous avions sélectionnées sur le plan écologique. Très bien Well, the secret is really a, a participation. It's involving local communities. That really is the secret. Because obviously, at the Great Green World Project, initially, we relied on the expertise of scientists. But these scientists themselves trained students and went themselves to meet with communities. So then they were known by the individuals around where the Great Green Wall would start growing. So then we had surveys as well. Um, there are three ethnies in Senegal where the Great Green Wall started, the Peul, the Molof, and the Berbers. And the, these people would rely really on livestock, not on agriculture, not on, on crop. Uh, and so we sent students and other actors to stay within the villages, to speak to the villagers and ask them, what species do you like? What species do you think we should be planting? What are your thoughts on it? And then we brought our expertise and obviously mixed it and uh, married it to the point of view of the local communities, the individuals living there themselves. Alors, ce qui était intéressant, c'est que toutes les espèces qu'ils nous ont proposé faisait partie des espèces scientifiques que nous avions sélectionnées, sauf une. Et dans nos recherches, parce que nous aussi après, on a fait des recherches sur l'intérêt de ces espèces-là qu'ils nous ont proposées et que nous avions aussi proposées sur trois choses, l'alimentaire, le médicinal et le cosmétique. Mm -hmm. Très bien. So, what happened is that the species that the villagers themselves put forward, they were exactly the ones us scientists had selected, except one. So we researched all of them. We researched all the species, including the new species. And we put an emphasis on three aspects, which were the feeding potential of these spe species. Are they going to feed people living there? Uh, the medical aspect and the cosmetic aspects. C'est ça qui nous a permis, en fait, de comprendre pourquoi l'espèce qu'ils avaient rejetée, en fait, dans nos travaux de recherche, nous avons trouvé que cette espèce-là, euh, il y avait dans les fleurs un poison qui est très fort et que les petits ruminants, s'ils le consommaient, pratiquement, ils mouraient, en fait. D'accord. Et vous savez quelle était cette espèce Vous voulez le dire ou, ou pas oui, on peut en parler parce qu'après, je vais, si j'ai le choix, après de citer les, les espèces, on va choisir. Ok, uh, je vais traduire ça. So, um, what, what was interesting is that this one species that differed between our point of view and the point of view of the locals, the locals actually had rejected one species. So, on, from the scientific point of view, we researched further and we found out that the fruit and what was produced by this tree 
was actually poisonous to cattle. It would kill the cattle, and that's why it was rejected. Um, so any um, yeah, and any cattle that would consume um, anything that came from that tree would would die. So then we understood. Donc, à moi, personnellement, ça m'a convaincu sur le fait que il y a un savoir local ah. empirique qui est là et qui est extrêmement importante. Et nous, je me suis rendu compte que il y a cet aspect que nous ne connaissions même pas. Et en utilisant ce savoir empirique local, ça nous a permis de faire de grands pas et à une très grande vitesse. And so that's, that's what I found very fascinating. Uh, with the scientific community discovered something that the locals knew. They had a knowledge that we didn't particularly have that we couldn't find in the books. So it was a, really a, a, an empirical, a local knowledge that was very useful. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we could discuss the details of all these trees and the community involvement all night. It's a, it's a template for good practice in any environmental project to have that kind of level of bottom-up community participation. Um, but at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, our audience. Um, do, do you want to translate that first, Fanny, actually? Thank Please. you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Donc, ça, vous, vous remercie vraiment. Um, um, C'est vraiment un, un exemple de d'implication de la communauté, c'est vraiment exemplaire votre processus, le processus que vous avez suivi. Euh, et et c'est ce processus de participation et de, de marier cette participation au, au savoir scientifique. Mais maintenant, Saïf aimerait proposer aux, aux personnes qui nous suivent, qui regardent cet entretien, elle voudrait leur proposer de, de poser des questions, si vous le voulez bien. Bien sûr. Bien sûr. Of course. <rire> Thank you so much, Professor. Senegal is really leading the way and daring to invent our future. Um, I'd like to bring in our two other panelists now. We have Don Mullen and Sarah El Said. Don is a best-selling author, filmmaker, concept developer, and humanitarian. He's the author of a number of politically influential investigative books that have led to various inquiries, including the Sunday uh, Bloody Sunday Inquiry. He's also uh, the executive producer on this film, The Great Green Wall, and as a consultant to the United Nations Convention to Combat uh, Desertification. Sarah Elsed is Irish with North African heritage and she works uh, for the Green Party Minister in the Irish Parliament. She holds an MPP from UCD and serves as a climate leader with Climate Reality. But she's also travelled and worked in Libya and has witnessed on the ground the realities of post-revolution Libya, where people have fled due to resource conflict and climate change. So you're very welcome, both of you. And I might start with you, Don, if that's OK, because until today, I did not realise that this beautiful film uh, was partly funded by Irish Aid. And Irish Aid has had a, an important role in supporting uh, the project. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your own involvement in it, too? Yes, well, I uh, had the privilege of being an executive producer on the, the, on the film. And uh, when I first learned of it, it was a, a missionary friend of mine working in Brazil who sent me a WhatsApp of a BBC short documentary uh, about the Great Green Wall of three minutes. And I was completely blown away because I was very much involved in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, but not since I was a young man has anything coming out of Africa really grabbed my attention uh, in the way that the anti-apartheid movement did. And, and here I felt, well, this is a wonderful um, project that, you know, really um, profiles Africa, you know, as a progressive uh, continent, a continent that is trying to find solutions to its own challenges, but also a, a project that really is important, not just for the continent of Africa, but for the whole world. And um, I made a phone call, um, and I, I found a young man called Alex Assen. And I, when eventually the, um, the Great Green Wall is completed, uh, outside of Africa, I think that Alex Assen, who is an Anglo-German, uh, he's done more than anyone outside to really bring this to the attention of the world. And, and the film, in fact, was, was Alex Assen's idea. So you'll probably have seen that in, in, in the credits. And one of the things I said, Alex, this is a brilliant idea. We have to get involved. And he was delighted. So I went and I talked to um, Niall Burgess, the Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, who put me in contact with Irish Aid. And uh, they were very pleased to, to make a contribution to it. Uh, but also one of the most important contributions of the Irish government was uh, they were asked 
uh, by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification to um, become a champion of the Great Green Wall. And I'm very happy to say that our president, uh, Michael D. Higgins, I believe has been more vocal about the Great Green Wall than any head of state in, in, uh, in, in the European Union. Um, and also, um, he was very influential as well in, in, in helping uh, the United Nations to get a donation of 1.2 million from the Department of uh, uh, Climate Action, Environment, Communications uh, for a report, a very, very important report called the State of the Great Green Wall Report, which was published uh, last autumn. And that really, in a sense, becomes the, bi the, the bedrock for the, um, the, the summit that uh, uh, President Macron recently had in, in Paris. They've had one disappointment. It's the fact that uh, our President Higgins wasn't included uh, in that summit because I think he has a lot to say. And also Ireland as a non-aligned nation, uh, I th think has a lot to offer to that region where colonialism has played a very, very devastating role. Thank you, Don. And certainly the, the project has been incredibly successful. So documenting that success is very important. I read today on the project website that 12 million drought resistant trees have been planted in Senegal. Uh, 15 million hectares of de depleted land has been restored in Ethiopia and 3 million hectares of land rehabilitated in Burkina Faso, 5 million in Nigeria and 5 million in Niger. And in the case of the Niger example, 500,000 extra tons of grain have been possible uh, because of the, the uh, rehabilitation of this land that was being lost to degradation. <laughs> so documenting that success is so critical in getting the buy-in and support from potential funders. And I noticed that at the One Planet Summit recently, 14 billion was promised uh, for this project. But I'm just wondering if, you, uh, if you're confident that that money will actually come through because in the past we've seen the pledges don't necessarily lead to the money coming in. No, I think, let, let's see. But I think we're beginning to build uh, in, in partnership with the African Union, uh, a very important civil society um, you know, movement. Yes. And that movement will keep all of those who made pledges like on their toes and we'll pursue them. Um, the, the State of the Green Wall report, which the Irish government funded, uh, it estimates that to complete the wall, uh, that's just across the Sahara, it will take 43 billion uh, euros uh, or maybe it's dollars. Um, and that sounds a huge amount of money, but when you think that Qatar is spending 220 billion on the FIFA World Cup in 2022, then you have to ask who is giving greater value and who is doing more for humanity, you know? So when you, when you match the two, I mean, there is, there's no equal. And this is so important, really, really so important. And what I love about this project and the reason why I got involved, it's an African project, it's an African dream, it's African led, and it has to be African delivered. And all of us, whether we're the United Nations, whether they're President Macron or President Higgins, um, or people in the, the private sector, you know, we have to be there in solidarity, walking alongside, but we have to make sure we don't do the usual colonial thing and try to take it over saying we can do it better. There's no one who can do it better than the African people on the ground. And it was very interesting to listen to uh, Professor Guys talking about how local communities have that knowledge to say, this particular tree we don't want. And of course, when they in inquired, it was because they knew that this was dangerous for livestock. Um, so that's why I'm so thrilled. And also, you know, like uh, it has to be acknowledged as well that Archbishop Eamon Martin and um, Archbishop, um, I think it's Roberts of the Anglican Church. I mean, they gave their Christmas uh, talk um, to the nation in 2018 about the Great Green Wall. The, the Society of African Missions under the leadership of Father Morris Henry have done a huge amount to bring this to the awareness of, of the Irish people. So there really is already a great awareness in, in the country uh, yes. and, and, and a growing support for the Great Green Wall. 
Absolutely. And I have to say, working in climate change policy, the news is always bad. So it's just so wonderful to have a piece of good news to report that this is something that we are succeeding in turning around as a, as a, as a global society and that there are solutions available if we put the, the resources and the supports in place to make it happen. Um, I might just turn briefly to, to Sarah and come back well, to you then, John, if you like. I mean, yeah. Sorry, we have a little delay there. Um, Sarah, um, you're very welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we, we have been speaking about this beautiful film. Uh, it's colourful, it's musical, and it's very beautiful to watch. But it also highlights the horrors that are being experienced by people in the Sahel region, particularly young people who are forced to, in many cases, abandon land due to degradation or conflict. And Maybe can you describe for us, from your experience, some of the ways in which migration is influenced by climate change and how this is playing out in Libya, the, the country that you're connected with and that you've been visiting. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, I, the, the, I think um, the, great, the Great Green Wall um, movie was very empowering. Um, it really highlighted the importance of our ecosystem in so many ways. And to me, it gives us a glimpse of the connection between uh, um, land aggregation and migration in the sense of a particular case, and in many cases witnessed across the world, forced migration, and as a result of climate change. So like we witnessed extreme conditions of drought, um, economic hardship, political instability, and violent conflicts leaves people with nothing but a last resort for survival, and that's to migrate. And this was clearly depicted, depicted in the movie for, um, for many in the Sahel region. Now, migration is not necessarily a, a bad thing or a good thing, but it is what the conditions that it occurs under. So as we saw Lake Chad shrinking demonstrates how resource scarcity can leave mm -hmm. communities vulnerable, leading them to migrate to other regions as they become displaced, which can lead to conflict between rival factions and, and tribes as well, because we have to remember that the region is quite tribal as well and can leave you know, communities vulnerable to insurgency of militia groups such as Boko Haram. Um, and there's the gendered element of migration as well. So to, especially to forced migration across the Sahel um, when men leaving to seek employment to support their families because they're seen as the providers um, for a family and, and, and um, that, that in, in its sense leaves women behind and children and the elderly at the forefront of battling the consequences of climate change and um, as they're left behind. So in terms of Libya, <laughs> Libya's had a, had a power vacuum and power struggle since 2011. This year marks 10 years Libya has, has been struggling um, and it's left the region open to rampant organized crime. Um, so when it comes to migration, there's mixed flows of migration coming from the East, West and Central. So the central Mediterranean route is, is as we saw, um, the crossroads of Niger into Libya, is still the most active route and most unsafe route taken by many migrants. The, there's a lack of border control and has become a breeding ground for criminal activity from human trafficking and smuggling networks, as we saw. Um, and the large, and what's kind of um, unsettling now is that there's a large number of unoccupied and separated children who are migrating through this route and are reaching Europe or trying to reach Europe. Um, and we have to remember that, you know, Libya is a large, large proportion of Libya is, a, is the Sahara Desert. And with many living along its beautiful coastline uh, or in the Nafusa Mountains or the Green Mountains, um, the journey to Libya is not an easy one. And I think that we underestimate that here in Europe. We think that this whole journey is, is, is easy and people are coming for economic gain and that's it. And that's not true. It, it, it's, just, it's, a, it's a tough road to go down, you know? So, and, and we have to remember as well, Libya is going through its crisis and the people there are faced with ongoing uncertainty and um, militia insurgency that is predominantly criminal gangs and enduring economic and social impacts due to the post-revolution. So sm smuggling there is taking in many different forms from being well orchestrated to kind of, um, which has become highly professional now, to kind of an informal step-by-step, -step which is organized by migrants themselves. 
So the costs are high. Their costs are high um, economically. Migrants have to pay to go take this route to, 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 to Libya through, or to some, some of them go to Libya or some go on to Europe. Um, and they face, you know, armed violence. They face incredible racism because we also have to remember um, Libya is going through, you know, during the revolution, there was a lot of scaremongering and a lot of um, talk of mercenaries coming from Central Africa and so on. So racism and discrimination is really um, evident on the ground in Libya um, with migrants. And then you, you see migrants, their lack of um, access to healthcare and so on. So now, um, you know, I have friends down on the ground working with um, the United Nations Refugee Agency in Libya, and they're telling me the situation is evolving in terms of smuggling and, and trafficking of people. Um, and they're being, so now they're being held at private locations. So it's becoming increasingly difficult for, um, you know, uh, UN um, representatives to get in and access these um, migrants because they are being located in different private areas, so um, locations. and the struggles that they face is a language barrier, lack of health care um, and lack of information and, their, and lack of, you know, knowing their rights. So there's a, there's a lot of issues in that regard. And there's also the element of trying to understand the, the, the different migrants that are coming through. Are they economic migrants? Are they asylum seekers? Are they refugees? You know, so it's very, very complex and not simple. So it's absolutely it's, 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 there's a high cost. Thank you for all that detail. It's it's a, it's an extraordinarily complex set of problems, as you say. But one thing we've learned from other uh, situations in the past is that when you start to treat it as a security problem, it changes everything. It changes the framing. It changes people's perceptions of, of, of incoming people into their communities. And it avoids addressing the underlying root causes, which are so well described in this very beautiful film. And, uh, you know, I couldn't tell help but feel drawn along on the journey that Ina is making in the film by the music and there's some beautiful references uh, in, uh, by, made by participants in the film to the way that music keeps people together to the way that music um, changes depending on the landscape that you're traveling through even mm -hmm. and um, there's one beautiful quotation from a farmer who says at one point everything you must do must be for your community and this is a very different way of thinking about the problem, say the problem of migration than the way it's depicted when we're looking at dinghies overloaded with people in the Mediterranean, for example. We, we see vulnerability, but we, we also see, you know, um, you know, invasion. And so I love this idea that everything we do must be for our community. And that means supporting communities who are trying to stay together and who are trying to survive under these dreadful conditions. And I'm just wondering from your experience in the parliament and working in politics, um, you know, if you think that's a different approach to environmental action than the one that we tend to see deployed in the West. I think we're learning now um, the role of, you know, climate justice. And, and including that in, in our climate policies. Um, I think you can see that having a common ambition um, in, this, in this development across the Sahel, you know, the, the, the Great Green Wall, plants the seed for empowering local communities and to reclaim their lands. And this turns the pay, um, this tur in turn paves the way for adaptive capacity for rural areas and empowering rural areas. And it's something that we struggle here in Ireland, you know, when we look at climate policy, people um, misunderstand when it comes to the rural dimension of it. So I think the Green Wall really does demonstrate that although land degradation is detrimental and has intense humanitarian consequences, such as conflicts, it does not always lead to conflict. And in this case leads to great innovation and um, cooperation and resource sharing, something that, we, something that we can most definitely learn from and be inspired by here um, in Ireland and in Europe. Exactly. And I was just going to maybe conclude by asking you, Don, we lost you there for a little while. I think the Internet went for you um, because you're involved with the uh, United Nations Convention on the Combating of Desertification. And perhaps the professor could come in here as well. Um, it obliges all parties that sign up to it to to work together. But it seems that it is practice. The, green, the Great Green Wall is very much a bottom-up initiative and that that's quite unique in terms of global environmental cooperation. 
operation where everything is sort of top down and it trickles down very slowly into little projects on the ground. But this one is different. It's special. It's huge in scale. It's involving 11 to 20 uh, African states. Um, is it an example, you think, of how we could be implementing environmental treaties like the Paris Agreement if they're going to be successful? How do we get states to work together to combat these problems in a way that involves communities at that kind of grassroots level? First of all, we have absolutely no choice. I mean, <laughs> we are told that we've 10 years, 20 years to turn this around. And, uh, you know, as was stated in the film, like, uh, people have made the pyramid, you know. So, I mean, the idea of growing a great green wall, a new world wonder, uh, is not beyond the bounds of possibility. Indeed, as Thomas and Cara said, we must dare to invent the future. So I think that the United Nations has to play a role of cajoling and trying to inspire. Um, but, you know, many people feel still the great green wall is at the level of kind of politics and, and it needs to get done. Now, what President Macron has done, and we've been working on it as well, is to call upon the private sector and the banking sector to get involved. But uh, I'm more involved now with Alex Asson with an organization called Civic. And our role is about creating a, a movement and it's a, a grassroots movement right across the Sahel. And we have a number of projects that we're actually implementing now. And, and also can I just say as well, not only is the Great Green Wall inspiring people around the world, but within Africa, there are now over 20 countries who've actually joined the movement because they're looking at this and saying, we need this as well. And there are two branches that are now growing from it. There is a branch going to go along the northern rim, even as far as Libya. Um, and, and then there's also a branch which is going to really grow deep down into the, 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 the southern um, drylands of, of Africa as well. So it really is an inspiring project. And I think also when we see what's happening in the Amazon, it's a great juxtaposition. But I think Professor maybe wants to also come in. Have you any comment, Professor? Oh, I can, um, I can translate a little bit yes. for Professor Gisse, if that's okay. Alors, Professor, uh, je vais vous donner un petit résumé, okay? Donc, uh, mm -hmm. Saïve, Saïve explique que le, la grande muraille verte c'est un, un très bon exemple d'initiative mondiale, dans le sens où elle, elle se demande si, si peut-être d'autres organisations pourraient la prendre comme exemple pour, faire, pour mettre en application l'accord de Paris, par exemple, vous voyez des accords de ce genre. Donc, la Grande Muraille Verte, eh bien, elle... Euh, c est, c est une, il y a la participation de 11 pays, euh, donc on se demande comment impliquer les communautés de manière un petit peu plus efficace. Et ensuite, euh, Don Molden expliquait que euh, oui, les Nations Unies doivent inspirer la population euh, et, et que la population du monde voit un petit peu comme la, la Grande Muraille, elle, elle pense que c'est encore au niveau politique, euh, mais ce n'est pas vraiment le cas. Il y, a des, il y a le président Macron, par exemple, et d'autres pays qui ont demandé aux banques de participer, au secteur privé, et Don Molden, il s'adresse directement aux populations locales dans la région du Sahel. Et maintenant, il y a environ 20 pays qui souhaitent participer à la Grande Muraille Verte. Si, si, Est-ce que c'est -ce est, est vrai Donc, euh, La Grande Muraille se développerait vers le nord, presque jusqu'à la Libye, et vers le sud. Euh, mon opinion, oui. c'est que euh, euh, le projet ou l'initiative est ouverte. Oui. Ça, c'est tout à fait logique. Hein. Bon, maintenant, ce qu'il y a, c'est que nous fondons aussi beaucoup d'espoir sur ce fameux projet euh, dont le président Macron a parlé dans One Planet Summit. Oui. On y fonde aussi beaucoup d'espoir parce que c'est nouveau. La seule inquiétude que nous avons, c'est que dans le passé, évidemment, il y a eu beaucoup de promesses de ce genre. Malheureusement, c'est resté seulement sous état de promesses. Il n'y a pas eu vraiment concrétisation de ce qu'on attendait d'eux. Oui, d'accord. Alors, je vais traduire ça si vous le voulez bien. Oui. Um, so, Professor Gisse is explaining, and my point of view is that the project is open. It's open to participation from any organization who's willing to, to contribute. And my hope is really that um, everybody will hear, for example, Pres President Macron's project, uh, the One Planet Summit, this idea that everybody can participate. Uh, because in the past, many promises have been made, but we have seen little 
pragmatic results, really. So uh, really what I want to say is that the project is open to contribution. Dans la mesure où, je ne sais pas, c'est bon Oui. Dans ah. la mesure où les pays y voient leurs intérêts. Je prends par exemple l'exemple du Sénégal. Oui. C'est-à-dire que l'impact aujourd'hui et l'importance, tout le monde le sait. Nous avons démarré depuis 2007. Or, depuis 2007, nous nous rendons compte qu'il y a une biodiversité aussi oui. bien sur le plan flore que sur le plan faune. Ça se met en, en place. Nous avons vu que les liquaires, donc les feuilles qui tombent au niveau du sol, enrichissent ce sol-là et ça permet de passer à des écosystèmes plus exigeants, plus complexes. C'est oui. déjà un, un avantage. Nous nous rendons compte aussi que puisqu'on ferme avec des grillages les parcelles, on permet à un moment donné aux éleveurs de venir récolter le fourrage. Et les gens, on s'est rendu compte que sur place, ils utilisent ce fourrage-là pour le bétail, ce qui réduit les phénomènes de migration que ces éleveurs faisaient depuis le ferlot jusque vers le sud et qui causait beaucoup de problèmes, beaucoup de conflits entre les éleveurs et les agriculteurs venaient de là. On se rend compte que ces conflits-là commencent à diminuer ce qui veut dire que donc ce projet de la Grande Muraille Verte peut régler beaucoup de problèmes. Et enfin, un autre aspect que nous avons remarqué et qui est en train d'être réglé, c'est tout simplement la stabilisation des enfants pour aller à l'école. Oui. Ça a augmenté avec la Grande Muraille Verte. Et surtout, ce que nous n'avons pas euh, prévu, c'est que ça a augmenté aussi la fréquentation des jeunes filles. Parce que lorsque les gens partaient, ils amenaient les garçons et les hommes les plus forts. Ils laissaient sur place les femmes, les vieilles personnes et les jeunes filles. Oui. Et ça a fait que depuis quelques années, la fréquentation des jeunes filles à l'école a augmenté. Très bien. Alors, je vais traduire ça si vous le voulez bien. Oui, oui bien sûr. Um, well, what's interesting is that uh, Senegal, since 2007, sees the huge interest that the Great Green Wall represents. Because to quote a few examples, we can see the great effect the Great Green Wall is having on biodiversity, for example, were it fauna or flora, fruit uh, fall to the ground, for example, they create a new ecosystem, they create some an, a litter, more complex, it improves the quality of the soil. Then we have areas that are closed off to to protect our to protect growing plants, for example, but we do allow um, uh, individuals who rely on livestock. So we allow herdsmen to bring their cattle for the cattle to feed close to the Great Green Mall on the on the area of the Great Green Mall, and that allows these herdsmen to stay where they are. They don't have to migrate even temporarily towards the south, which is something that used to happen. And when they would migrate, then this would create conflicts with the local populations more south. Um, and then a third aspect as well. Um, so so that's it looks like directly the Great Green Wall is contributing towards stability of the, the area, the immediate surroundings. And lastly, um, children seem to be able to go to school uh, more. Sadistically, children in the area of the Great Green Wall are going to school more regularly. And then lastly, um, all of this migration that we see in the film, in the documentary, we see that many men leave the area in search of a better conditions, life conditions, basically living conditions. Well, more men are able to stay, which means that that has a huge impact on society. Men stay, they may marry locally, they may have a family, again, more stability. Oh, I think you're muted, Saïf. I just want to let you know. Uh, what an impressive <laughs> uh, su set of successes you've described there. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, we have one question from the audience for you, Professor, which is really about the state of environmental activism in Senegal and, you know, whether or not ecological ideas are taking hold in the country. And if you have a strong civil society structure uh, supporting climate action in Senegal. And you might be brief because we have to finish up very soon. Thank you. Sorry, alors, donc nous avons une question qui nous vient des spectateurs, euh, professeur Guité. Donc, euh, c'est une question à propos de euh, l'activisme 
euh, dans le secteur de l'écologie euh, Est-ce qu'il est qu y a beaucoup d'activisme dans le secteur de l'écologie euh, autour de la grande muraille verte Que pourriez-vous nous dire sur ce thème Alors, effectivement, nous donnons un, un exemple. C'est-à-dire que nous commençons à faire comprendre aux gens que euh, l'écologie en tant que telle, qui n'était pas tellement connue en tant que telle dans ces, ces endroits-là, nous commençons à leur montrer que le fait seulement de reboiser avec des espèces bien recensées permet de régler beaucoup de problèmes, y compris les problèmes de fertilité. Moi, je, personnellement, avec certains étudiants, nous travaillons sur des espèces qui, lorsqu'on les reboise, les feuilles qui tombent, se dégradent, vont donner une activité euh, sur les bactéries du sol, et en particulier les bactéries qui... Euh, rentre dans le processus de la minéralisation de l'azote, c'est-à-dire qui transforme l'azote organique en azote minéral. Or, nous savons tous que ce sont ces substances-là, azotées, qui sont responsables pratiquement de la fertilité des sols. Oui. Au lieu d'utiliser des engrais chimiques, on leur dit, mais désormais, plantez ces espèces-là, vous aurez un sol riche, pratiquement, et qui va essayer d'engendrer et qui va augmenter les rendements de manière naturelle, sans pour autant produire des engrais chimiques qui vont passer dans la nappe phréatique et qui sont des produits, en fait, dangereux, dans le vrai sens du terme. C'est passionnant, donc je vais, tra je vais traduire ça. <rire> <laughs> so, um, well, I'd like to give an example, uh, I'd like to give an example in that um, the Great Green Wall and the work that has been done and that is being done around it from a scientific point of view is encouraging people to see that it works. So it's basically, it's, it's rooting this idea of ecological activism and it's by example, it's leading by example. I'll give the example of um, um, this notion of planting species of trees, planting, you know, using plants that are very well adapted. Um, as I explained, we did a survey, etc. that nothing is random. Uh, it helps with uh, soil fertility. So it helps with the, the fertility of the land itself around the trees that we chose to plant. Um, and in particular, I'm working in university with my students. I'm working on species that contribute, that contribute to increase the variety of bacteria found in the earth, in the, the compost, in the soil. Uh, and we are finding out that the fruit that are falling from the trees we pick are using, are, are helping this variety in bacteria. And it appears that we are managing to transform organic um, azote into mineral azote, which is an achievement. And this uh, in, improves uh, soil fertility. And this, all of this without using any chemical, um, any, any chemical help that would be found uh, further down. And um, so it enriches the soil without using any, any chemical help with it, which would be harmful in the long run. Thank you so much uh, for that. And um, I think we need to wind up now. So on that note, uh, we will conclude our discussion for the moment, but hopefully everybody is leaving inspired and ready to go planting trees, right trees in the right place and uh, supporting the Great Green Wall and promoting it as, as a project that, uh, that should have the backing of, of states and of, of private enterprise. I'd like to thank the French Embassy for organising this and the uh, Irish Film Institute, uh, but especially our panellists this evening, Professor Ali Goose, uh, Don Mullen and Sarah El Said for contributing our appreciation uh, to this beautiful film, our appreciation of this beautiful and inspiring film this evening. I must say I enjoyed it immensely and I recommend the music as much as anything. We didn't talk about the music, but the music is, is, a, is a reason enough to watch it. So congratulations to all those who uh, brought this beautiful project and beautiful film into being. Um, the Green Night of Ideas continues until the end of February with three further screenings, including the family adventure, Spread Your Wings, the groundbreaking Home by French photographer, reporter and environmentalist Jan Artus Bertrand and his new documentary Legacy, which has just been released in France. These are uh, much, must watch films to understand the climate emergency and the heritage that we are leaving to our children. And details of that are available online. I think there'll be a link that will be posted 
posted in the chat box so you can just click on that and I think some of the uh, films are free to view as well. So with that I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to everybody who's uh, joined us this evening and um, hopefully we will get together for real soon to enjoy <laughs> films and trees in real life up close. Thank you so much everyone. Merci, thank you very much. Thank you.